Well, this is Seisha, near the tip of Cape York Peninsula. Gary Wright, a friend of mine, is the top fishing guide here. This is the famous Seisha Wharf, gateway to the tip of Cape York. They say you can catch a fish any time of the day or night. When this ship leaves the Trinity Bay, I'm going to give it a go. I came up on this ship behind me because the roads are cut because it's the end of the wet. And I can tell you, it's the only way to travel. They really look after you. Well, I'm here now, Gary, and I want to join that club. Oh, yeah. I want to catch a cobra off a manta ray. It's a pretty exclusive club, Rob. <laughs> You've just got to have the right conditions. It's not an easy thing to do. You mean I could have come here for nothing? I might not do it? <laughs> it it's going to take a bit because uh, the weather plays an important part. Uh, the sea conditions, the coastal flats, uh, the time of the tide, uh, and the, the, <coughs> the mantas have got to be there in the first place. And then, of course, we've got to have cobia following the manta. So uh, there's so many things in it, but you know, people do it every year. Not a lot, it's only a very small handful. So you will join a very select group of people if you're able to do it. You mean if the tide's right, if the prawn balls are there, if the manta are there, if I throw the lure in the right position, and it's gotta be a popper? It's gotta be a popper. <laughs> Next thing you tell me, it's got something to do with the moon too. It has as well, Rob, yeah. And, you, and I've gotta to check to see if you're holding your tongue right as well. So we'll uh, stick to this one area for a minute. It doesn't take much of that wind action to uh, get it a bit surfy looking. Up on him. Okay. Just recover it. Right, I've got me, mate. He's a bigger one. Is he? Yeah, a lot of areas, queen fish this size have just disappeared. We're lucky we've got so many of them up here. He's a bit nice fish. Look at that, mate. Lovely queen. <laughs> Get up this way. 
Yeah, that was yeah. pretty easy. Yes, a lot of fish. So this is Jackie Jackie, eh? Yep, this is uh, the East Coast, uh, the huge mangrove system here. Jackie Jackie, it's the largest pristine mangrove system in Australia. And uh, it's a distinct advantage to have it because um, when uh, it, conditions get really uh, windy on the western side, we come over here and fish. And uh, when the conditions aren't right here, yeah. we uh, fish on the west coast. So. The best of both worlds, yeah, eh? Yeah, I'll say. Yeah, it's just... I'm jealous. <laughs> Well, let's get in there. You're going to catch me a barra today, That's are we? Right. That's a good cool tie up uh, just up on this smooth mangrove. That one over there or that one there? Yeah. See if we can get a barrel interested. Yeah. Here he is, right at the boat. Well, what he did was he, he pulled the, the bait off, um, pulled the bait down, and I leant back on it. And then when I leant back, he spat it out, which is a characteristic thing to do, but I thought he had it. And uh, he's come back and he's taken another swipe, but it's right near the surface, he got the bait off. So he's pretty keen. Party animal, mate! <laughs> <laughs> You've got to appeal to him. <laughs> I'm not sure where they like blue balloons, so uh, it's not hard then to tend to usually take anything to throw them back at them in the water. He's up with that shack on. There's the shark again. <laughs> Come on, let it go. Almost to jump into the boat too. Yes. He's got a bit of kick in here. Ooh. Turn him round. Nice one. Nice Look fish. At that. that is a nice fish. Now that's a fish. Yeah, this is a typical New Guinea canoe. Look at the size of it, eh? Oh, it probably arrived in the uh, last wet. With that northwesterly blowing down here, we find a lot of canoes get away from the villages up in New Guinea. And there's been some very big quality Wakatoys and uh, recently built canoes that have arrived here just after the wet season or during the wet. Well, he's 
flags up, Rob, and he's not on board. He must be down on the wreck. Yeah, nobody am I right? Hey, good day, fellas. Good morning, you. Good day, You're on the job early, mate. Yeah, mate. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but uh, I've got Robbie Brettle here with me. Good day, Rob. Nice yeah. to meet you. Same here. I've heard a lot about you. <laughs> yeah, we've been just fishing over here, Hubert, yeah, and I saw your boat, and I thought it was yours, and I thought, oh, well, I'll bring Rob over to meet you, and uh, perhaps you could tell him a little bit about this wreck here. Yeah, no worries. Uh, I was just getting myself dried off and uh, get rid of this gear, and then we'll have a bit of a yarn about it, eh? Uh, yeah, it's uh, Queensland's Titanic, really. Um, 133 people died on that. She sank in about three minutes and was about oh, just after nine o'clock on, on February the 28th, 1890. They were steaming north for Thursday Island when, when the accident happened when they struck that uncharted rock. And it was approaching high tide, so the rock would have been fair way like four or five meters below the water. And the ship's draft up at the bow was actually 19 feet, so she only just crazed the rock and what is, the rock sort of comes, it's granite, it comes up like that gradually to a peak. And the ship itself, as it, so we're looking at going with the ship, it was sort of like that. There's the keel, and she struck here, right on, on the starboard mm. side. And because the ship was built out of cast iron plates, the plates it just shattered like ceramic tiles, and, and instantly the water just shot in and... Uh, it took about nine seconds at, at 13 knots to, to, do, the to, whole length to do the whole length of the boat and it had to gash into it. And it just dived, drove itself to the bottom. I guess all the cabin doors slammed shut too at the time. Oh People yeah, because uh, all the lights would have gone out and because mm. it was after nine o'clock, most of the first class passengers particularly that have already been in the cabins. Mm. And as the ship tilted over to, to port, they couldn't get out anymore because they got totally disorientated. No lights, and as you said, the door slammed shut and water coming in, they were just cold. Now, you can, when you're swimming along, you can still see the gash just in here, in the starboard side. And it goes along for about 55 meters. Now, where it, where it first struck is right here under the what they call the forefoot. And the, uh, the keel slabs are sort of bent back like that, a couple of them. And then she started to break across here, right up to the gunnel, both sides. She, she opened up in the forward hull, and then the gash goes along here, and then it's sort of interrupted, then it's broken again, and it's sort of an intermittent gash all the way back past the engine room into the after hold. And that gash extends over 55 meters. So within nine seconds that it took to run over the rock, the ship lost all her buoyancy. In three, in three minutes, 133 people died.
Thank <laughs> you.